it's nice to be here. And I would also like to tell you, this shirt is perfect for this talk. I'm very excited to be wearing this today. And that's why my slides are yellow. It's specifically to go with the shirt. I'm very into that. <laughs> yeah, I got this at a thrift shop. I was like, they were putting it on the mannequin and I had just gotten this talk except I was like, you take that off, that is mine. <laughs> All right, we are T minus one minute. I'm probably gonna like blast through these slides. Um, and then I'd really like to just open it up for discussion. because I think that this is like one possible approach, but I also know that I'm also one human being, which means I probably haven't thought of the best idea. There's a lot more of us in this room today and there's a lot more of us outside of this room participating in this conference. And I'd like to see if we get better ideas for how to solve this problem with engineering. Um, so with that, it's 5.05, packed room, very excited. Um, today we are gonna talk about how the gender gap in open source is a metadata problem. And because I do believe that it is a metadata problem, it's something that we can solve through the engineering of our interfaces and the way that we provide contextual information around developer decision-making. My name is Sal Kimmick. And I do care about diversity and open source, um, but I've never given a diversity talk before. So this might be a little bit unhinged. I'm gonna have a lot of fun, but I'm like very excited to be giving a talk without a tech demo for once in my life. Um, if you wanna follow along with these slides or keep them on your own, you can go to tinyurl slash OS metadata um, and reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and if you wanna continue this discussion, I would absolutely love to. Before we get started, I'm going to start with a call to action that's absolutely unrelated to this talk, but also important. Um, so I care a lot about cybersecurity. I also care a lot about incentivizing developers well. Um, if you are familiar by now, we've been really talking about it. There is a new open source security mobilization plan that is going into action now. We are developing a two-year plan for that. Um, there is both the printed document available from OpenSSF.org and the running document that's openly available for you to look at the plans and the tasks that we are actively deciding on right now is at this GitHub. So the OpenSSF has a large plan of 10 tasks that they're taking on. I'm specifically taking on one element of the education and that is the rewards and incentives for maintainers and developers because one of my agendas in life is making sure that we all say thank you to the maintainers who keep this all running. I have been a maintainer myself and thank yous mean a lot. It's a very hard job. Um, if that really interests you, get engaged. The more people that get involved, the better the ideas will be. Um, so definitely look into it. Now, that's the end on OpenSSF for now. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna describe exactly what this problem is, exactly what it's scoped to. It's a very specific problem I think we can solve. I'm gonna tell you why I care so much. I'm gonna talk about who helped me to figure this out and who's worked on this problem before, the benefits to open source security, what happens if we fix this, and how we can start to think this way to build a better digital future in open source. So what exactly is the problem that we're trying to fix here? So I think that open source is a deeply human activity. It can be, it should be, it must always be. It's the community effort and the trust between individuals that allows open source to thrive. I do not wanna get rid of that. What I do wanna get rid of is unnecessary contextual information at one very specific decision point. When you are first reviewing a pull request, I do not believe that there should be any contextual information about the individual, their image, their handle, their uh, email. It should only be the code that you're looking at in that initial review. And there's a couple of good reasons that we will discuss for this. At the moment in which you decide to accept or reject a pull request, all of that metadata should immediately become available. You should know who that individual is. You should be able to interact with them normally but in that very specific moment, we should be removing that data and there's great statistics to demonstrate why. I wanna do this because open source is deeply human. 
but we have not succeeded in fully opening it up to all of humanity. And that means we do not have, statistically speaking, the best decision makers in the room. And when I really like to motivate people around this problem, I'd like to remind you that if we only have 6% female representation in open source, that means that we are missing 44% of the global population. What is the chance that the best contributor to your open source project can't contribute today, doesn't feel open to be able to contribute today, possibly doesn't know that your project exists? We really need to be able to engage with those populations and make sure that they are welcome in a way that they can verify. And a little bit more about what I'm talking about today. My background is in neuroscience, so I love to look at the ways that our brain understands information. What color is this can? Yell it out. Does anyone see this can as anything other than red? Well, we have no red blindness in the room. Uh, that can is not red. There are no red pixels in that image. This is called cortical fill-in. It is a higher level of processing in your brain that is filling in the contextual information because it has seen this object so many times that it is giving you the assumption, the visual illusion that that is red. I can send you this image file to zoom in if you would like to. And this is to say that you are biased and even when I explain to you that that Coke bottle was not red, did you cease to see it as red? No. So when we're trying to take approaches to diversity and inclusion, when we're trying to educate individuals about how to be more open and inclusive, that's excellent, that may work on some level, but humans are very good at categorizing and prejudicing information which has been successful, useful to them in the past. That's excellent. It makes us really good computers, but it makes us really bad at new contextual environments. And as we begin to better globalize open source, we need to make sure that those biases that we bring with us from our lived experiences do not make their way into the decision-making, which should be exclusively about the quality of the code contributions that we take in. I'd like to talk about what I'm not talking about today. Bigotry. We can't solve it. It's a pretty natural part of the way that human cognition exists. There's positive and negative bias all over the place. We're not going to be able to remove that from the human brain, but we can contextualize the human brain in an environment which makes their decision making easier. I'm gonna be talking a lot about cognition today, about the way that the human brain takes mental actions or processes to acquire knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. Not sure why that's coming up, but what this said were some sad statistics. Uh, so some sad statistics about gender diversity. When I got interested in this concept, honestly, I'll tell you the real reason why I was interested in it, because last open source, I was sitting in this diversity uh, chat uh, I was getting a lot of those, you know, let's hire more women, let's train more women, let's improve mentorship. Um, but no one was talking about how we systematically engineer for it. Um, and then I went to karaoke afterwards and talked to some of the individuals from the new stack, and they said they were really interested in taking on this research. So we started diving into it, and this study really stood out to me. This is a peer-reviewed academic study from 2017, which reviewed real GitHub pull requests from men and women. And what's fascinating here is that when they removed the contextual information, we're speaking to the image and the handle and the email of that contributor, women's PRs were accepted at a rate 4% higher than the average of men's when there's no identifying information. Now, when you take those exact same pull requests, exact same code, and you put that metadata back into it, the decision-making around that then inversed that. Female contributions dropped by 9% per 
below the acceptance rates of men. That is a 15% gap, a 15% gap in the best contributions getting accepted in this case, as we measure that by mergeability. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, women contributing to open source do tend to contribute at a later stage in their careers when they tend to have production experience. So they are tending to provide statistically higher quality code just for that reason. Um, I, I found this incredibly fascinating. There has not been another study looking at what it looks like to do this systematically reviewed. We need to see this, and we need to see this for other demographics. I also think that we need to be considering masking metadata for what is really close to my heart, a cybersecurity issue. There is absolutely an increasing supply chain attack on open source projects where they are attempting, hackers will take on the identity of a known contributor. They will submit code as the identity of that known contributor because they are aware of the halo effect. That code will not be as highly scrutinized as an unknown contributor. They'll often provide a decent amount of code that looks like a typical commit, and they'll add a little backdoor into it. It merges just fine, but if you aren't looking for that four lines of code, that's your problem, that's in your code now. So if we remove just at that one moment in time, review the code on the quality of the code alone, we can make sure that we can reduce some of the effects that are going both positively and negatively in this space. And there's other solutions around cybersecurity that I'll talk about later. We should put in verification into all of these massive ecosystems, but we need to put a Band-Aid on this bleeding wound right now. We need to remove the ability for these hackers to use these social vectors with ease. And so if we allow this to go into place, this possibly will have a positive effect that we could track. And I'd like to talk a little bit about why I care so much. One, a little bit because of where I came from. So I am Native American. I come from a very un underrepresented uh, background in technology. Uh, only about 23 to 25% of us ever go to college, and then almost half of us don't get out of college. Um, in order for me to get through college, I had to get funding through all of these institutions, uh, meaning I was spending most of my time in college studying and writing grants so that I could continue studying. It's a very different experience. I eventually uh, got into a PhD program through National Institutes of Health where I was studying uh, metacognition, which is quantitatively understanding how excellent performers, high performers, we're talking like Olympic performers, how they know when they've gotten something right. How do they make good decisions? Really, really, really fascinating space. When I jumped out of that, I had a lot of supercomputing experience. I was pretty good at scalable Kubernetes. I then went to go work for Missile Defense Agency, Kessel Run, um, on really mission critical projects where we could not have failure. So it was very important in those spaces to have very hygienic decision making across those developing that code. I then made a permanent move to the UK and started working fully in open source. I've contributed and maintained the Chaos Toolkit and also reliably. Um, that's where I got my original maintainer experience and why I insist that we say thank you more often. I now work at Sonotype because I've become really interested in these supply chain attacks and seeing what we can do to engineer that experience to remove those. At Sonotype, we take a really interesting approach to cybersecurity. You cannot be doing this at the enterprise level for these supply chain attacks. We instead were the original developers of Maven Central, which is the largest repository for open, uh, open source projects in Java. And we put an immune system around that. We remove the vulnerable packages there so that they never go downstream. That is a really powerful approach, and it's why I work with them now. We're also doing the same for Python, which I'm very excited about because Python's also a little bit on fire. So you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, before I really moved into tech, uh, these are the things that I was thinking about, right? I really care about how humans make important, critical decisions 
in moments particularly under stress. So one of the first jobs that I had was watching pilots uh, in Boeing 737 aircrafts, seeing how they uh, interacted with the cockpits and with each other and finding what the missed information in those dashboard was that we would need to engineer into the new cockpits. And I put this up because this is a fondant version that is incredibly accurate that took us like three days to make and I'm just really proud of it still. So you all get to look at that. Now the metacognition that I was mentioning before, this is a really interesting space where we are finding out that brains actually work differently when they are in a highly contextualized environment, right? This can be PRs, for example. So if you have reviewed a thousand PRs, you're probably better at it than someone who's done it the first time. You're probably relying on some implicit contextual information that you're not highly aware of. This is all being done at the level of subconscious. I'm not going to talk much more about my PhD today, but my advisor just put out this book and it's very, very good. And the last chapter of it goes into the implications for artificial intelligence and I just think everyone should read it. It's very good. I'm very biased, very biased towards it, but read it. It's a good book. And I also care about this because I accidentally solved this problem before. So I'm not standing up here saying, hey, maybe this would work. I've proved it once um, and I proved it to myself by accident. So here's what we did. Right, so I was working on real-time uh, fMRI, uh, which means that my machine has to be working in order for me to get real-time data. And one time, my machine broke, and it took three months to fix it. And so I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I was like, I have no data to put on my beautiful supercomputer. I am so bored. And this is what I thought about. I had three months without my beautiful machine, which I do miss. I was in a field with 18% female representation, and there were zero online training courses for big brain data, and I was really interested in starting to get involved in cloud. So I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. So I created a thing called the Online Brain Intensive. It was called Intensive because I knew I had a limited amount of time, so I scrunched all of this into a like two-month period and made everyone do this at a really accelerated rate. Everyone complained, but it was all volunteer. Welcome to open source. Um, we were preparing them for a brain hack, which is a really cool part of uh, computational neuroscience. We contribute a lot, like primarily to Python. My first contributions to Python was rewriting a bunch of R into Python. How boring, but it needed done. Um, and we got AWS Educate to fund it on the condition that those who completed the course would receive computing credits to be able to test their hypotheses. Now, when I ran this the first year, um, this is what we got. There were almost 1,000 participants, 748, from 42 countries. At the end of it, they consolidated into 12 teams uh, and produced seven peer-reviewed papers from this. And in a field with 18% female representation, my course had 56%. Um, I found that was interesting, but you know, it didn't really highlight any curiosity in me at the time. I was also interested with my signal processing background in seeing what we could do to make sure that the exchange of information between individuals was structurally as equal as possible. So when we designed the Slack, I said for each of these experts, even you have to be anonymous. You can go in there, have conversations with individuals, but because no one knew who the expert was in the digital room, those conversations were much more cordial. They were much more interesting. We then organized by topic, we prioritized by value, and I also wanted this to be as accessible as possible. So I made sure that all of these educational resources were asynchronous um, and they provided a video and a repository for individuals to use. This is just to say like how cool this was. Like we got all the way up to like generative intelligence on SageMaker, it was awesome. Um, then we put the teams together, but this is what really interested me. Every week I asked the experts who on this anonymous platform had the most interesting unanswered hypothesis, right? That's what we were trying to engineer to find. And over 80% of the time they identified a female participant. They did not know this. I was the only one who did. When I investigated this further, at first I was like, oh no, what's happened? Have I inverted my statistics? It should be 20% or 50% in this case. 
But it was 80% because I had accidentally created as a PhD student a resource that individuals who were much more senior in their career, either in their first or second postdoc, were utilizing, specifically stating they needed to use my pathway to AWS computing credits to be able to have equal access to computing to test ideas. They were not receiving equal access to funding, re equal access to computing. And when we made it equitable, they were able to get this work done and move their careers. So what's interesting here is like, it wasn't gender equity that we got. We were signal processing out in the way that we were traditionally doing computational neuroscience. We were signal processing out the best ideas. And when we removed those social biases, we were able to surface them immediately. So who helped me figure this out? Jenny Riggins the best, took this on, was super curious about this, and has been helping me reach out, get interviews, find contextual information. We've interviewed people who have created versions of this already. So Emma Humphreys created Zombie, which is a Mozilla integration. Brian Alore created a Chrome extension. Um, this is a problem that's been around. People have known about it. They've tried to solve for it. And the Newstack has been putting out a series of articles. If you want to read into a little bit of depth on this, we cover this uh, on the Newstack on can this boost security and diversity. There's one coming out just today all about that zombie and first attempt, their motivation, some of their findings from using it internally. Um, definitely go check that out. In a couple of weeks, we're going to put our final part of this article out. And I am putting a call out to anyone. If you have any interesting data around this already, any ideas, let us know. Let's talk to you, and let's get the word out. So what are the benefits to open source security? So the problem that we're trying to solve here is called malicious code injection. It is when someone takes on the identity of that known contributor or a known uh, maintainer. It's incredibly hard to track if you're not using something like PGP, or, um, although even then you might have some issues. Now, this is a good approach, but again, it's like a Band-Aid on like a big, big wound. I still want you on these major projects, I still want you to actually be using best security practices. Definitely use SIGSTOR, although SIGSTOR still goes to your email, which means it's basically the same security surface area that we already have a problem with in GitHub. Although, safe and signed git commits with PGP, much better idea. There was just a talk on this today. If you missed it, look at that name. Make sure you get that recording. Instantiate that on your open source projects. My god, please do. Our supply chain attacks are increasing. Um, but my problem here is people tell me that there's these solutions. Like, I don't work in cybersecurity. I'm aware. But these aren't instantiated on some of the biggest open source projects we have. We need them there, but it also does not solve the Coca-Cola problem. It does not solve the fact that maintainers are sometimes seeing red when there's no red to be seen in the pull request. So if we want to solve this problem now, we need to create this layer of social engineering on top of open source so that code quality is the focus. Now what happens if we fix this? I want us to quantitatively test what it looks like to design these systems well, to design systems. I mean, we all use GitHub, and GitHub was designed to process code. I mean, 85% of us do. But GitHub was not designed thinking about human cognition. And as these systems get bigger, we need to be much better in designing these. If we can instantiate this on some major projects, we can do a pre and post evaluation. And I would like to see this amongst several other metrics. Will we see a improvement in the quality of community engagement, of geographical diversity, gender diversity, and in the quality of code and mergeability? I suspect that we will. It also demonstrates on a qualitative level to your community that you are serious about inclusive community engagement, right? I also just got the statistic from this conference, so I don't know exactly where to cite it from, but I'll find it. Um, but I think this is fascinating. If we make these spaces genuinely more inclusive, it means that more people engage. If we get only 10% increase in the contributors to open source, we could see a $95 billion, well, billion euro increase per year. Um, these kind of 
ways of removing, essentially we're still just removing individuals from being able to participate in something even when they have great ideas. Remove that barrier, people are going to get more engaged and stay more engaged in your community. So how to build this better digital future? Number one, we need to engineer this. This needs to be integrated directly into the GitHub platform and the other platforms as well. It's way too hard to maintain these external integrations, and I say that having spoken with the maintainers of those integrations. Number two, we need to implement these. Maintainers and community managers should take this on as a code quality best practice. Linux Foundation is already interested in possibly instantiating this as a best practice that can be badged. Number three, we need to reward. So we need to make sure that we find the communities where they're taking social engineering of open source seriously, where they're taking quantitative metrics seriously and rewarding them for being genuinely inclusive environments. Now, I reached out to GitHub several times and I'm not here to like yell at GitHub, but it took a change.org petition for us to be able to vote on issues. Do you remember this like eight years ago or like they just wouldn't do anything until we did a change.org petition and maybe this is what we need to do to get the interface changed. But like, is anyone disappointed that we can actually vote for issues? Like that needed to happen. Um, so we might take this approach to it. But what I really need is maintainers. I need maintainers to take this seriously, to want to test this, to see if this makes a difference on large open source projects. And again, this solution isn't intended for the six person uh, project or even the 15 uh, contributor project. This is really for projects like Prometheus. When you have so many contributors that you have to right now lean a little bit on your social biases while taking these ingestions in, um, those are the spaces where this is going to have the best impact. And this is not exclusive to automation. Let's put more automation in, let's put these security best practices in, but let's remove the Coca-Cola problem at the same time. So this is what I need. I've got two calls to action. I really need your help. I need your help in petitioning GitHub to consider putting this into their platform so that maintainers have a button to push in order to put this best practice into place. Number two, we need to revitalize the efforts on the extensions that already exist. This is open source. I hate seeing the creation of wheels when wheels already exist. Let's just blow up the tires on the wheels that exist. So if you're interested, these two repositories are the best ones. These maintainers are interested in having more engagement and we can put these back into place um, and sort of extend their use utility. Um, if you are interested in doing this, I would love to talk to you either now, I've made sure that we've got plenty of time to chat, um, but reach out for me for questions, for comments. Again, I would like to not be the smartest person in the room. It is very likely that someone else here has a better idea than I do, and I want to hear it. And that's my talk. Thank you. So with that, do we have questions, comments, concerns? So thanks for your talk. So I have, you mentioned that 10% increase in contribution would increase the GDP. Can you please explain how does it work? That comes from a slide from another talk at OSS. I just thought it was a great statistic. I don't even know where to cite it, but I will find it and I can send that to you. Um, so the belief here is that, right, when we're working in open source, let's just strip it down to what it is. It's intellectual property. It's the creation of new utilities, right? Um, so when you are developing new utilities in this space, it implicitly makes it easier for economies to produce new products. Um, so when we see these advancements, these small advancements in open source projects and their interoperability as ecosystems, that allows for new things to be developed, new products, new industries, new sectors. Um, that's really what that is speaking to. And my argument here is that we're not going to see that kind of increase if we continue to do diversity in the way that we're doing it. We need to systematically rethink the way that we've structured engagement between individuals digitally. I have a question. So, uh, oh, 
Yeah. Do you think that the, like um, if they would be like all of the pull requests would be anonymized? Do you think that it would affect like I'm I'm pretty I, I would guess that some people like like to do contributions because they get get internet points like mm -hmm. they get some stars or some some extra cred from like you like you mentioned social credit mm -hmm. for doing that. Do you think uh, well? Of course, that's we can discuss if that's a good thing that people do it for that or only for the social clouds. But but do you think uh, it would affect like the amount of requests that people would uh, submit or like the like do you think some people wouldn't want to contribute because they would know that it, it ends up as anonymous uh, contribution? Yeah, so this is scoped to a very specific aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I think that the moment you decide to accept or reject a pull request, all of that data becomes identified. You should know exactly who you're speaking to. You should continue that at a personal level. Yeah, open source doesn't work unless we give each other internet high fives. Like, we all know that. Um, yeah, I'm not arguing for any kind of anonymization anywhere else. Immediately begin to have a conversation on an individual level as soon as you are ready to have that conversation. But the statistics are showing us right now that that metadata is biasing that decision making away from the highest quality of code, which I find really, really concerning. So no, do not make the internet anonymous. Just remove the data in this literal one snapshot of a decision, nowhere else. So uh, I, um, oh, excuse me. I apologize here. Um, this may be a little slightly outside of the context of the, the current talk, but um, you mentioned, you know, 86% of us use GitHub. Obviously, GitHub is a lot, but it's not everything. Mm -hmm. um, there are other uh, fewer projects, but significant projects like the Linux kernel that use mm -hmm. other development mechanisms that are a lot harder to be anonymized, like mailing lists. Do you have any ideas or similar concepts we could apply to fixing the problem in that space? Sen, you know how I feel about mailing lists. <laughs> um, so as a signal processing engineer, I think that mailing lists are incredibly inefficient. Um, there's a lot of information loss in handling intellectual property as a chain instead of a centralized source. There's also benefits to that, right? That decentralization is part of the argument for it. Um, in those spaces, uh, yes, possibly. Um, I, well, it's a little bit different. I mean, we've got to speak to the kind of communities and the kind of communication that's typical in them. So what I'm really premising this problem on are very large distributed open source projects, primarily CNCF, I'm very biased. Um, but when we're speaking to the mailing list for the kernel or you know, the mailing list for a lot of the Apache software projects, for example, those tend to be uh, smaller clusters of highly embedded, highly engaged individuals. So anonymization may not even be as effective in those spaces, right? It's, this is not going to be very effective if you know the digital handwriting of the 17 contributors that are always contributing to your project. Um, but that is something that I should think a little bit more about. I imagine it could be, right, when you instantiate the first issue or discussion around production, um, possibly anonymizing that is valuable. But then immediately you're going to be in like a long email thread and then inevitably someone's going to lose that email thread and it's just a very inefficient way to work. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a data question. You had mentioned that you, to anonymize, it would be email, handle, and the picture. Mm -hmm. um, does it have to be all three? Could it be um, just the picture? Because if you pull the data from um, profiles that maybe have a default pic um, photo or an avatar, could that potentially tell you something about um, the current state without the other two? Yeah, I mean, in my dream of dreams, mm -hmm. when we're doing this metadata masking, we replace those with like nonsense, uh, like titles, like giraffe emperor and like a fake cartoon and just like make it fun to engage with. But isn't um, that what we started out with? Like avatars, yes. right? Yeah, so. exactly. Um, 
So it's interesting. I've, uh, for years, I uh, put out a call about two or three times a year uh, to take on two or three early career data scientists. This is meaning they are not yet, they are still in school. Um, and some of them haven't even started up their GitHubs yet. And when I speak to them, I do have to encourage them to like, if you have a strongly femme identifying first name, just include your last name. Do not put a picture of your face in there because you are statistically significantly less likely to have your first pull request accepted. I really do not want to have to keep making that recommendation. So um, yeah, I mean, make your images whatever you'd like to. But right now, if you have a female identified face, you're going to have a 15% less likely chance of getting your PR accepted than a male identifying face. And that's for no reason. I was also thinking about if the GitHub is enough to make the change because I also participating in the Linux kernel using mailing list. And from the sense I was thinking that if would that make sense to make the anonymous change in not the GitHub, but in Git itself? What do you think? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. That's a pretty good idea. Um, so still being able to track the chain of intellectual property, but removing all of the metadata at all. Um, that's a really interesting and like terrible way to put it. I was going to be like hard typed anonymization. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that might be a reasonable approach, but I mean, at the end of the day, Git is just a versioning technology. Um, the reason why we've built these platforms on top is to embed the social element, right? And I don't want to remove the valuable conversations. I do not want to remove the Socratic method that follows for days and weeks after you submit a questionable PR. Um, I think that that's super valuable. It's why I participate in open source. Like a few years ago, I was working on these like massive distributed Boolean networks and I had like contacted this maintainer like five years before and had some like weird, weird questions about the way it was working. Um, and then I contacted him like half a decade later and I was like, hey, I'm working on this and it needs a hundred nodes. Is that even like possible? And he just sends me a thing and says, oh, no, it's you again. <laughs> I was like, yes. And he's like, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, yes, technically, but give me two weeks. Um, so yeah, that's what makes open source fun to me. I don't want to remove that. And if we remove that, people won't want, I wouldn't participate in that. Um, and that's why the second that you decide to ingest a snippet of code, you go right back to it being humanity-based. That's really what I want to see and experience and continue to have being there, verifying that trust, um, but also verifying it with PGPs, please. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I would argue for that level of an anonymization, um, although it's conceivable and testable, right? It would be interesting to see what that does to a contributing community. Are we all good? Are we all going to go do this on our open source projects now? Yeah? Cool. Well, get in touch with me. Let's see if we have better ideas than me. Um, and let's see what we can get done. <laughs>